my great privilege and honor to introduce our keynote speaker this morning. A true giant in the field of IP law, Professor Ruth Okediji is the Jeremiah Smith Junior Professor of Law at Harvard Law School and the co-director of the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard. In addition, Professor Okediji served as the chief technical expert and lead negotiator for the delegation of Nigeria at the 2013 WIPO Diplomatic Conference to conclude a treaty to facilitate access to published works by visually impaired persons and persons with printed, uh, print disabilities. In 2015, then United Nations Secretary, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon appointed her to the high level panel on access to medicines. Professor Okediji is an expert on international intellectual property, traditional knowledge and genetic resources. Her widely cited scholarship on IP and development has influenced government policies in Sub-Saharan Africa, the Caribbean, Latin America, and South America. In addition to her work with international organizations, Professor Okediji is the recipient of numerous awards for excellence in teaching, research, and mentoring, including the professor most likely to go beyond the call of duty, and the Student Bar Association's Outstanding Professor Award. This is high praise indeed. So on behalf of everyone today, uh, Professor Okediji, um, welcome to our conference and I'll turn the floor to you. Thank you so much for that warm and gracious and completely undeserving uh, introduction. Let me start by saying good morning, bonjour. That's the end, the start and the end of my French um, for the duration of my uh, talk this morning, but I wanna say thank you. Thank you to uh, Sippo for inviting me to uh, give this keynote address. It is my honor to join you and I'm grateful for the opportunity to share some thoughts with you um, at this fifth annual IP data and research conference. As you've already heard uh, this morning, um, both from our introductory remarks and from the materials indicating the themes of the conference, uh, this is an important conference because it aspires to address issues that affect all of us, issues that affect the choices that we will make as citizens, issues that affect the way in which intellectual property administration um, will be conducted and issues that question whether the way we have done these tasks in the past are in fact the best way forward. In an important uh, quote by Stephen Hawkins, not made in the context of AI as such, but entirely applicable uh, to AI, he said that the rise of powerful AI will be either the best or the worst thing ever to happen to humanity. We don't yet know which. And quotes like these often remind me of the very important uh, challenge that intellectual property law faces. There is an illusion that what we are dealing with is a binary relationship between the inventor and society or the inventor and the IP office. And in between, of course, these two important actors in the IP ecosystem, the reality is that there are many decisions that are made by a number of decision makers. And certainly in the digital space, platforms, for example, make certain decisions, users engaging in platforms make a host of decisions. And there are many decisions made between the inventor's aspirations or hopes and the decision of the intellectual property office to award or recognize some form of intellectual property right. And what I wanna share with us this morning is that when it comes to artificial intelligence, it is neither the best nor the worst thing to ever happen to humanity. The best or the worst thing to ever happen, I would suggest to you is made up of the choices that we might be making in how we regulate artificial intelligence and machine learning, and in particular, how we regulate the data that feeds and sustains machine learning. There's a general, almost universal consensus 
that the IP system provides incentives to creators and, in and inventors to produce socially beneficial products that advance social welfare. The US Constitution, of course, says um, as much. It famously identifies public welfare as the goal of congressional authorization to grant exclusive rights to authors and inventors. The uh, Canadian provision, the Patent Act of Upper Canada, the 1826 preamble, um, says something similar. It shares aspirations of the expedient encouragement of genius and the arts. In other words, when we think about the objective of the intellectual property system, this idea of public welfare, of social welfare, is embodied in judicial decisions, international treaties, and it remains an integral part of the policy justifications for the strong defense of intellectual property systems. Now, this is interesting because although there is considerable consensus about this philosophical orientation of the intellectual property system, the idea that the public welfare is at the very core of innovation policy. In fact, there has been very little discussion about its normative goals. There's been almost no analysis, as uh, Bukafusco and Masur point out, of why creativity and innovation are good. This is simply taken as a given. Now, this is a problem because as it turns out, the statements about public welfare um, go to the fact that no one really wants a legal regime that works adversely to the public interest. And so it's a surprise that the inquiry about what values or what consequences attach to innovation have rarely been pursued and neither have answers been deployed. In fact, this question of the public welfare is generally outsourced to other legal regimes. And so it's important to note that the feats that we think of when we think of artificial intelligence and machine learning um, are in fact astonishing. But in order for artificial intelligence and the intellectual property system to work seamlessly, we must have ethical reasoning and we must have principled leadership to guide our policy decisions and to inform doctrinal developments. In my remarks today, I want to briefly reflect on the costs and the consequences of the current paradigm. There are some principles I suggest we must consider as the interface between artificial and intellectual property activity accelerates, and there are broad policy goals to which we can, and I would say we must, aspire. The idea that intellectual property is an unalloyed good has proven significantly problematic for innovation policy. It has proven problematic for IP administration, and it has proven problematic for the larger norms of privacy, of liberty, of equality, and of community that in fact do improve social welfare. We already know, for example, that IP imposes significant monopoly costs. We know that it has the potential to chill follow-on innovation, that improperly calibrated, it can reduce access to valuable technologies and to creative output. Repeated extensions of the copyright term, the evergreening of pharmaceutical patents, the proliferation, of um, these patents have operated to keep valuable innovation out of the public's hands for longer than the IP welfare bargain might otherwise suggest. Indeed, some scholars have suggested that intellectual property may not actually incentivize innovation in the way that our traditional narrative envisions. Michael Boldrin and David Levine, for example, have argued that strong enforcement of IP rights disadvantages current and future innovators, as well as ultimate consumers, because what it does is it serves to cement the dominant position of market actors after innovation has occurred, rather than incentivizing innovation um, contemporaneously. Similarly, Josh Lerner's empirical study of 60 patent systems over 150 years indicates that policy shifts towards greater patent protection have not produced statistically observable positive effects on innovation. And yet, economic historian Zarina Khan notes 
that despite all of these flaws and the potential for arbitrariness and corruption in the system, we have yet to come up with workable alternatives. As Malcolm first observed, we are left with a deep uncertainty about the effects of the patent system, but it remains in place because removing it would be too risky. We know that there are gains that have come to us from the intellectual property system. We know that there are losses that have come to us from the intellectual property system. Our empirical data, our studies have not yet definitively said one way or the other, whether we are worse off with it or even that much more better off with it. So if we think that remaining in place for the intellectual property system is important in an age of rapid technological innovation, the question is what does this mean for ever increasing diversity and new modes of creativity? And when we consider the policy choices embedded in the IP system, the question becomes, how do we reduce welfare costs? If we're going to accept that there are certain social losses that are associated with the intellectual property system, then the question is how we reduce those welfare costs. Rapid innovation, technological frontiers that are accelerating means that the policy choices that are embedded in IP law are always up for renegotiation. In most discussions about IP policy, most people look to the specific language of the relevant patent or trademark or copyright legislation. But in view, in reality, it is not the text of the statutes that really define the moments of renegotiation. In most of these discussions, in my view, it is actions by firms, market actors, courts, and intellectual property office that are quite critical in the process of recalibrating and readjusting the purposes of intellectual property to confront the new technological frontiers that we have, such as we have today with artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, of course, offers opportunities for us to consider and to reconsider the trade-offs and what the policy boundaries should be concerning the orientation and rules of intellectual property. Now, one of the reasons I think the role of firms and of innovators themselves and intellectual property offices and courts is so important is because already in the international system and certainly in national systems, that role has been delegated to these individuals. For example, we know that in many um, uh, patent regimes, and in fact, in many trademark regimes, there are systems that recognize morality exceptions with regard to patentability and even with regard to trademarks as well. Certain copyright cases, for example, in UK versus AG, um, AG versus uh, Guardian newspapers um, that have suggested restrictions on copyright for immoral works or works that are contrary to the public policy. And of course, we know that many states recognize morality exceptions for trademark registrations. In other words, there are ways in which the pernicious effects, the welfare reducing effects that we've accepted as part of the IP system do get um, addressed within the intellectual property system itself. But of course, there are other welfare costs. The reality is that like the world, AI has taken IP by storm. And in the midst of the rapid deployment of artificial intelligence, we are also dealing with a history of bias and a history of inequality within the IP system. There's a history of unequal access to IP rights, to IP protected works, and to IP offices. We know, for example, the Black inventors were often historically denied access to IP protection, both formally and informally. We know that women have been underrepresented in IP and, of course, in science. We know that there has been a failure to recognize and appropriately protect indigenous groups' traditional knowledge through the IP system, and that the IP system, in fact, at times, facilitates its unlawful appropriation. We know that um, during the colonial period that IP rights were denied to local citizens, which has had longstanding consequences for development efforts in the global south. In other words, we have come face to face with the welfare costs that were not internal to the IP system per se, but were external to it and very much helped 
in shaping the IP rules that we have today. IP has been used to protect and protect discriminatory content as Kevin Green has highlighted for us. And of course, in the wake of COVID-19, as we heard from um, the Honorable Minister, what we have seen is that in fact, the pipeline to inequality appears to be growing as disparities between men and women during the COVID-19 period uh, exacerbated. Inequities are not only limited to women and to minority groups and indigenous populations. But it is also the fact that the patterns by which we see data being generated about this treatment is now creating a confluence between the external functions of the welfare costs and the internal doctrines of intellectual property, which have been well established. The reality is that artificial intelligence has taken IP by storm. In every core subject matter, copyright, patent, and trademarks, AI has affected core questions of subject matter eligibility, of rules and processes of acquisition, and what are the appropriate types of limits or exceptions to protection. And what we see, of course, in the work that has confronted the bias in the IP system is that the practices and the doctrines themselves can have a disparate impact on minority groups and on underrepresented groups. In fact, the practices are what have produced the data that the requirements tend to be skewed and that the formalities tend to make access to the intellectual property system very difficult. Now that portends important considerations in the age of AI, because the question is, can AI produce different outcomes? Now, when we think about artificial intelligence, I think it's important to note that there are at least two reasons why I believe that this technological frontier is meaningfully different from other challenges that other technological frontiers may have brought about. We know, for example, that software uh, uh, took the IP world by storm and that we are still grappling with the subject matter eligibility rules for the protection of software. But there are at least two reasons why I think this frontier is different. First, it is imminently clear to most people that there are profound ethical considerations and costs involved with AI governance, particularly for intellectual property. In fact, it is so radically different that we are asking the question upfront, something that we don't normally do, as I said earlier, in the intellectual property system, other than giving nations the capacity to exclude certain things from protection, we normally outsource the welfare costs and burdens of intellectual property, but not now. With respect to artificial intelligence, machines or systems that are capable of simulating human intelligence, we have started asking the question whether the ethical considerations and costs need to be incorporated at the outset. There has been no outsourcing of the social welfare calculations. And this is important because as we know, there are some forms of AI that learn iteratively. Artificial intelligence improves itself through training with large data sets, what we otherwise call machine learning. In fact, what it is, is pattern recognition. As Dan Burke would, would very quickly tell us that there are differences between the idea that a machine learns the way human beings learn, which it does not. But rather, it is trained to detect patterns relying on significant data. There is no, as I said, outsourcing of the social welfare calculations. And it's important to note that the gatekeepers of this pattern recognition and its use will be IP offices and courts who must first make the initial determinations about whether a particular innovation meets current tests of eligibility. Many of these IP offices and courts are largely making these determinations in the dark. There are no doctrinal rules per se for IP specifically. There are no treaty precedents that suggest what guardrails should be employed. So the first major difference is that we are considering the ethical consequences of artificial intelligence up front and what those ethical consequences will mean for intellectual property offices and for firms and for courts 
will begin to work itself out long before legislatures begin to adopt legislative frameworks. This is a challenge. The second significant difference about this technological frontier is that the data necessary for machine learning is subject to problems that are beyond the scope of IP law to discern or to correct. This is a significant problem. It's a significant problem because AI is everywhere. It's in e-commerce recommendations. It's in chat boxes and virtual assistants. We know it's the automotive industry has been talking about self-planning cars and optimal route planning. It's in legal services. It's in food processing and, and supply chain management and grading. It is everywhere. It is everywhere. And so the data necessary to make all of these recommendations and decisions within these specific industries rely on data and on pattern recognition. And if there are problems with the data, as we know there often can be, this is typically beyond the scope of the current ecosystem of intellectual property to fully address. And I'll come back to this point in a minute. But let me suggest a third significant difference as a result of the first two that I've mentioned. And that is what Sumi Kim refers to as black boxing. While AI is everywhere and while the value propositions for AI is exponential, it also carries with it the pernicious possibility of black boxing, which is an important challenge to innovation. Black boxing is the outsourcing of learning to machines, this pattern recognition that informs a machine and allows a machine to predict when a particular outcome or consequence is likely to be the case. So rather than spending years of learning or education going to school to learn how to make decisions and to discern what might be right, what might be equitable, what might not be, in reality what happens is that workers can now with reliance on artificial intelligence, simply deploy a software program that already embeds the knowledge. This is what we call black boxing. In other words, just like a heuristic, black boxing allows us to take shortcuts to the knowledge frontier. No longer do we have to train and learn the critical skills of discernment, of judgment, of wisdom, perhaps even self-control. We go to a computer software, we press the button and we are immediately like Spock in Star Trek, I'm dating myself. We are immediately transported to whatever the frontier edges are of new technology. And what this does is that it frees innovators and workers from having to learn the critical details of old knowledge and instead to focus on producing new ideas. And so when we embrace data, and machine learning reliant on that data, and we outsource or attempt to outsource the questions of the social impact and the social biases of that data, we create and repeat and reinforce the same silos that produced the biases and the inequities with which we are trying to overcome today. What happens is that machine learning and the data on which it is based creates a knowledge base that tricks us into thinking that we are using accurate and appropriate frameworks. And they suggest, importantly, that thinking outside of that framework, thinking outside of the box is improper. That's dangerous for innovation. We're outside of the box thinking is precisely what has advanced the technological frontier. It is also extremely dangerous for a data-driven artificial intelligence economy. And this is important because lapboxing coupled with imperfect data or biased data or dirty data, coupled with an intellectual property system that often attempts to distinguish innovation policy from welfare policy might reduce the quantity of innovation and also reduce social welfare. For these reasons, issues at the interface of artificial and intellectual property 
are fraught with implications for the future. And there's a danger that existing approaches to artificial intelligence governance have yet to directly engage the role of intellectual property in calibrating these implications. The best example, and because of time, I won't go into too many examples, is the OECD principles for AI. In most OECD countries, even as the profound possibilities of artificial intelligence are recognized and valorized, there's clear recognition of these social effects. As I said, the ethical considerations are upfront and discussed in every form and every way. And so the OECD AI principles, for example, recognize that stakeholders should proactively engage in responsible stewardship of trustworthy AI in pursuit of beneficial outcomes for people and the planet. Laudable aspirations, including the augmentation of human capabilities, enhancing creativity, advancing inclusion and representation of underrepresented populations. So the very goals of the intellectual property system, which we see in the Canadian Patent Act, we see in the TRIPS agreement, we see in the US Constitution, this idea of advancing social progress is now somewhat softly codified in these OECD AI principles. And it recognizes in quite explicit fashion, inclusion and sustainable growth as a goal of an ethical AI stewardship. But what does this really mean for the regulation of technologies that are hostile or that undermine such priorities? The principles are interesting because they state for their rationale that responsible stewardship for AI is a recognition, and I quote, that throughout AI system life cycle, AI actors and stakeholders can and should encourage the development and deployment of AI for beneficial outcomes. But in discussing the policy tools to pursue these objectives, intellectual property is not on the list. So again, despite the ethical discussions we have about reliance on data. In fact, we don't see intellectual property as one of the objects for reorienting and recalibrating the consequences that we all know data produces when it is in fact biased. Now, in the 2021 final report of the US National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, one of the objectives is to implement comprehensive intellectual property policies and regimes. For the United States, AI is a national security priority, and this is true in many other OECD countries. But the question is what kind of IP policy does artificial intelligence need to meet the goals that we have highlighted? Inclusion, sustainable growth, clean energy, sustainable planet. Now, while we're having the policy debates, Patent applications and grants for artificial intelligence have been on the rise. With those patents on the rise, we see a broad diffusion of AI across technologies. In other words, patents for AI have the interesting effect of further embedding AI applications without the significant policy implications being addressed. Now, when we think about AI and its applications, I wanna suggest that there are actually important considerations that should inform our policy discussions. First, and I'm just gonna note these very quickly as I begin to wrap up, there's an inverse relationship between sources of data and power over that data. And this is a dynamic that IP policymakers and IP offices are going to have to think about if we're serious about embedding the ethical and the social welfare considerations into IP policy. So for example, we've got privacy situations and privacy conflicts. Um, we've got platform regulation that is a problem. There is an inverse relationship between sources of data, consumers, and the power over that data. And that's what generates the conflicts we've seen over privacy regulation and platform regulation. Second, there is a disparity of interests between owners of data and the users of that data. And so almost repeatedly, contracts that give you access to different platforms almost have you signing away your interests as an owner of data. There's also a divide between those who need data solutions in the global south 
and those who have access to that data in the global north. There is a divide between small and medium enterprises and large firms. In fact, if you look at the patent statistics, Google and Samsung dominate the patent portfolios um, for artificial intelligence. Last point that I think is important for triangulating data policy for AI is that data policy is largely the result of private choices by firms. While data governance requires governments around the world to start thinking about carrots and sticks for regulation. Now, I've mentioned AI bias and I, and I want to be clear that there are important considerations when we think about the quality of data that informs AI. First, as many of you who are IP experts know, data itself is not often protectable under any of the IP categories. We may see something different. Um, of course, we have the database directive and we have experiments to protect databases, but by and large data has always stayed outside the construct of the intellectual property system. That may change. Of course, compilations of data could be uh, protected. But obviously one of the challenges that we find is that there is bias in the data. And this has been written about extensively, so I'm not going to go too much into it. But there's no consensus about the definition of AI, but it refers to these systems that, that use data um, to learn and to, as I said earlier, create patterns of recognition. So Apple, Siri, Amazon's Alexa, Microsoft's Cortana, Google Assistant, you see all of these uh, uh, applications of AI, Grammarly, for those of you who use it to write, email documents, it's everywhere. But when we talk about bias in these systems, I think it's important to take note of what Dan Burke has disambiguated for us. And that is namely that data bias involves at least two different types, statistical bias or skewed data, that is data that is non-representative or involves non-representative samples, or that improperly include or exclude certain data sets. So when this kind of, of bias, this, this statistical bias, excuse me, uh, sets the parameters for what you use to train the machine, then all of the analysis that is based on that, on that data is problematic. You could also have, of course, bias because you choose the wrong model or the wrong statistical model for training. But the point, of course, is that choices are made deliberately to codify and to curate data. So in that sense, all data will have some bias. But the question for us in intellectual property is whether or not the data and what is included or excluded is fit for the purpose for which that machine is being trained. And of course, the best example, as you see on the slide in front of you, is facial recognition. But there are serious concerns that there will be significant consequences in other areas of the law. Can machine learning overcome biased data sets? Probably. A recent study says that diversity in the training data is crucial. And so for those who are involved in assessing data, this becomes fairly important in the consideration of what we think of as artificial intelligence and what the intellectual property system should do when it comes to diversity in data training. Now, there are global dimensions of this problem because as we look increasingly at the interface between intellectual property and artificial intelligence, the question then is how should the IP system treat AI inventors, creators, and data? What access should AI systems have to protected content? And how should IP offices engage with AI data? Of course, the leading question is, can AI be a patents inventor? And we know that this is a question that is live on the table today in front of the Canadian Patent Office. There have already been some responses. Some countries say yes, Australia, South Africa, some say no. Germany has an in-between position and Canada is considering what its outcome will be. In a world in which we have deeply embedded harmonized rules of intellectual property into our national fabrics, artificial intelligence promises to implode the degree of harmonization that we thought we had accomplished. Because once we change 
the who is entitled to be an inventor, there are many more questions that we have to ask. Who's a person skilled in the art? Or should we be changing the standard to an AI skilled in the art? What counts as obvious to AI? Ryan Abbott, who has been the most vi uh, vivid advocate um, of um, AI as inventor, talks about the importance um, of inventive AI replacing the average worker and the solution being that the skilled person should be an inventive AI once it becomes the standard for research in a field. But the questions go on. What counts as enabling disclosure for AI? Many of these questions, many of you have probably already seen, but there are some questions that we also have not asked that perhaps we should. Shouldn't we ask, for example, was the data ethically sourced? Shouldn't we ask, for example, is there bias in the data set? Should we, this be part of the application for the patent? Should we have certifications of neutrality that we have in fact checked to ensure that the data is unbiased? Similar questions, of course, in the area of copyright protection. Can AI-generated works receive copyright protection? And we're all familiar, of course, with the next Rembrandt project. We are familiar with AI-generated art. And of course, the examples go on. AI, of course, cannot be a works author, some say, but at least there are three potential approaches. One is simply to deny copyright, to deny IP in that work. And of course, the other is to recognize that there has been a human actor and to perhaps generate protection or grant protection to that human actor the work's legal author. This is a, a, a decision that certain countries have already made. And then of course, other countries are considering a sui generis right. But I think it's important to note that these are questions that IP offices and that innovators and the markets are going to also be involved in making. We see, for example, that in the UK, section 9.3 of the CDPA, has what ostensibly is used to resolve the, a, the, the UK position. But it doesn't end the problem for courts and for IP offices. How will we make the distinction between these works? How should human contributions be isolated? And how do we even define and determine who this person is by whom the arrangements necessary for the creation of the work are undertaken? And as advancements in AI continue, the capacity of machines to even make these judgments will only increase. And lastly, should the data be accessible through some series of exceptions? Now, we have already seen some proposals by Mark Lemley and Brian Casey saying that AI works for training should be available under the fair use doctrine. But of course, the fair use doctrine is in fact unique to the United States. That does not prevent or preclude Canada or any other country from developing an exception to, to, you, to have access to data sets. But if diversity in data is critical to the outputs that the machine learning makes and to the recommendations on which policy is based, we're going to have to think about access to data for training purposes. Lewandowski argues that applying use to AI, fair use to AI training may be problematic, but you see that of course, that there's some uh, Creative Commons uh, licensing prospect that he advances. And then of course, some countries have introduced text and data mining exceptions to cover copyright infringement um, activities. The problem is that the construction of data is now going to become a relevant consideration for the intellectual property system in the age of AI. So what is the role of the IP office? The IP office, as I said earlier, is a gatekeeper. Of course, IP offices are already deploying AI within their own operative means. But as you can see on the slide in front of you, IP offices administer IP rights, they advise on policy, they assist rights holders and the public, but historically they have done more than that. And they continue to do more than that because they are the gatekeepers of policy before the legislature gets in. AI bias is insidious in the administrative process of intellectual property. And it is important for offices to vigilantly scrutinize AI outputs 
for that bias. And of course, AI bias may be more pernicious. Statistical bias may be harder to discern, and that's why certificates of neutrality might be something to consider. But the tendency to reinforce past biases by iterative learning is something that IP offices really have to watch out for. I suggest in conclusion three possible modes, a minimalist mode, the use of AI to perform small administrative or technical tasks. So we see that happening in many IP offices already. An integrated intelligence mode, use the AI to perform tasks at higher orders of intelligence. But as you move up the integration of AI into an integrated intelligence, then the obligation for debiasing the machine data becomes important. Then of course, a managerial model that uses AI to oversee the core competences of the office. Each of these models have policy implications, including the extent to which AI off IP offices rely on the data given by applicants. The challenge from our IP administration today is that there is significant information asymmetry be between applicants and the office. The office is over understaffed, overworked, often without the resources to really do some of the careful scrutiny of its operations for the impact of its policies. As we move forward into a world in which AI is not yet governed by clear policies, in which the interface of AI and intellectual property continues to generate more questions about the impact of bias and the impact of AI on human welfare. It's important that we recalibrate and reconsider the ways in which we have framed the intellectual property objective. We must do more than simply say that it's okay for innovation to proceed and that we'll worry about the social implications later. The risks that AI poses to deepen inequality, to constrain privacy and freedom of operation, to undermine competition policy is too great. And the role of intellectual property policy and the role of IP offices has become much greater and much more necessary than we have seen in the recent history. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Okediji, for a very thought-provoking uh, presentation. Thank you for um, providing such a great overview right from fundamental issues and how we should take nothing for granted. Um, and uh, just to also build on what you said earlier, beam me up, Scotty, as we've entered into this brave new world of AI. I truly appreciated how you were able to look at the, the welfare costs in, in the world of AI and intellectual property. And uh, one, one question we have here is uh, with regard to a comment you made about uh, how patent offices and decisions uh, may have impeded uh, the access to uh, IP for various communities, and in the case of the question, African-American inventors. I was wondering if we could uh, unbundle that a bit, in particular, as you were talking about uh, the use of data and how data locks in bias and perhaps stagnates future innovation. How could we be cognizant of that to avoid any inherent bias in application and administration of IP? Thank you um, so much. And I realized that I went way over my time if we only have 15 minutes for, for questions and answers, so forgive me. Um, you know, I think that it's important to check the illusion, which is quite strong, um, that because we are reliant on data, somehow that data is more accurate. That's the challenge. I, I think a healthy dose of skepticism, when a patent examiner is looking at claims that are set forth by the applicant for the patent, that patent examiner doesn't go in saying, wow, you know, everything in this patent application is in fact correct and there's a presumption that the patent applicant has stated everything accurately and completely. The patent examiner goes in with a set of questions that inform the degree to which they probe and they ask questions. And I think there's a healthy skepticism that we must have to the data sets that produce the patterns on which we rely to make policy. And so I, I would say that Avoiding the illusion of objectivity in the data is, is an important step in um, assisting IP offices in thinking about um, 
unlocking potential bias. I, I think particularly with the administration of IP rights, we are going to need to impose questions on, on applicants, um, the source of the data, um, um, any kind of, and, and minimal, right? Because we have a duty of good faith that we already impose on applicants when they come to IP offices. And I see no reason why we can't extend that duty of good faith um, to the kind of assertions that they make about the data that um, they have based their application on. And I think IP offices in choosing to deploy a particular application of AI also needs to do this with um, vendors. Um, I've been talking a lot with governments and, and you know, procurement offices are an important part of this life cycle of trying to, uh, to ensure that the data that we are using or the AI that is being used in government offices um, satisfies some minimum criteria consistent with the OECD um, AI principles, but particularly focused on the way in which there is some method to evaluate the particular bias in a data set. All data sets are biased. It's whether that particular bias in fact undermines the objective of the IP system and the IP administration that is at question. Let me ask you this, what's particularly interesting, and you talked about it, because the technology is evolving so quickly, it sometimes leaves us in a bit of a policy vacuum. And that vacuum is filled through private sector applications, IP offices, courts. I was wondering, in your, your, um, your expertise in this area and what you've seen globally, is there a particular jurisdiction that is doing this well in terms of trying to lay out the groundwork, the framework, the parameters around AI to facilitate its use and its appropriate use? And, and what are the features of that jurisdiction's approach? Yeah, um, I, I don't know personally um, of, of a jurisdiction that is uh, ahead of the curve. Um, one of the challenges, of course, is, is you well know, is that IP offices are caught between a rock and a hard place. They have to respond um, to uh, the government and to legislative mandates, and they have to be customer friendly. The model of intellectual property offices that we have today is, in my view, quite impoverished because there isn't an autonomous policy setting um, function that we easily recognize for IP offices. I will say that the Australian um, IP offices have been quite diligent in thinking about ways to carefully select what they use artificial intelligence for and what they don't. So as I said, the low order level of, of doing some searches, um, of, of um, identifying um, defunct trademarks, et cetera, those are, I think, fairly low risk, low level, but important tasks that are being used to deploy AI. I would say that what I've seen um, um, that, that I think is worth mentioning is first that there's a sense of what we want to use AI to do in the office. What are the tasks that would be useful in allowing the office to function better as a gatekeeper and as an implementer of the social welfare objectives that innovation is meant to deliver. And offices that have a clear vision of what it is that their core functions are and what could be used to improve those core functions are always better because they do a data audit and they do an AI audit to figure out whether the use for which the AI will be um, deployed is consistent with the kinds of gains that they're hoping to receive. Now, that takes resources. It, it, it takes resources that many patent offices, many IP offices simply don't have. It takes resources in terms of people resources that many offices also don't have. And this is, I think, um, I don't know if your minister is still here, but I think this is one um, important dimension of thinking about how to present both budget requests, but also to work in tandem with other offices of government to think about the ways in which you deploy AI. Because as I said, if you have a statistical bias, if you have an error in the data set, and because data sets are not really regulated, these are choices made by private firms. Um, if you have an error, the parameters around which the recommendations of the machine are made will result in essentially a poison set 
of decisions by the office. Um, and that is something that you absolutely, I would say you want to avoid. There are a lot of questions in the chat right now. Um, I'll pick up on a theme from many of these questions. Uh, and that is uh, linked to the key theme of this conference is looking at diversity and inclusion uh, in the IP system and in innovation. Uh, I touched earlier, as you did, about um, access to the IP system and how there may be uh, biases there as well. Uh, the facts are quite clear when we look at applicants for IP coming through our front door at SIBO, uh, that uh, the proportion of women represented in our applicants is, is low. And I wonder from, from your perspective, um, what are the particular areas of challenge or opportunity that we could look at to, to address this in the long term? Knowing that it's much larger than just the IP system, but I'd like to get your thoughts on that. I, I really think that um, we have an ecosystem problem. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we know, and I think it's true uh, across the board in most countries that, that COVID-19 had a, a significant disparate impact um, on women in science and women in the professions in general, um, certainly even academics in terms of the production of scholarship because daycare centers shut down. If, if a woman was a primary caretaker, there, you know, there goes um, uh, the time you've allocated um, for work. So my view is that there needs to be some explicit acknowledgement of that disparate impact. Um, and there needs to be some system of support for female inventors. Um, for example, I, I think about this all the time and, and I know this is being recorded and being watched by many, many people and I hesitate to say it, but there are many countries that are in violation of the TRIPS agreement because they in fact do discriminate between national citizens and foreign inventors by, for example, uh, discounting fees, um, having expedited processes um, for certain types of innovation. Um, there was a point where in the US, um, we had a, a pilot program in which we um, fast-tracked green technology applic uh, patent applications. There are ways within the discretion of the patent office that the unique circumstances that create barriers for women who are applying for patents or who are applying for other forms of intellectual property protection uh, could be incentivized to overcome. Um, clearly, those are decisions. There are some that the patent office can take. Um, there are others that will require some legislative amendments. Um, but the combination of both incentives that are directed to overcome those specific barriers, including um, assistance with processing time, assistance with, um, with filing, are things that I think would be really helpful to increase the numbers of women who are um, applying. There is no prohibition of the TRIPS agreement for distinguishing between um, genders when it comes to um, the application of the administrative process. And so that is a loophole that um, I think most IP offices are not exploiting sufficiently given how significant the emphasis has been on the gender bias and, and um, um, with regard to the IP system. But I, I think we're not going to get away with simply doing business as usual. There needs to be some focused direction on overcoming the hurdles that make access to the IP system so difficult for women um, um, in general. One, one more question from the, uh, the floor here, and this is from um, Professor uh, Richard Gold. Uh, and I think it's probably in reaction to uh, the question of IP offices acting independently and coming up with policy directions. So the question is, uh, what international governmental organization, WIPO, OECD, et cetera, is best positioned to develop harmonization over IP in the AI field? Um, this is a hard question. Um, uh, I, I think that regional organizations, frankly, in my view, are best. Um, because regional organizations tend to um, gather uh, practices and um, cultures 
and find ways to streamline them because you already have so many other regional institutions in which those cultures are being deployed. So for example, I, I could see something happening um, under the auspices of NAFTA. I could see it happening under the auspices of the OECD, or the EU or the African Union. Um, and then having a more of a polycentric approach because the problem with harmonization um, is the same problem um, with data sets. When there's an error in a harmonized system, it is difficult to detect, it is difficult to correct, because to correct it means undoing 160 you know, something odd countries, um, and there's no room for experimentation. At the multilateral level, you tend to find hard rules which are difficult to undo. Whereas at the regional levels, you tend to find soft rules, which over time um, with experimentation uh, get refined to determine what are the best practices. And then from those best practices, um, we get some hard principles. Um, and so I, I think for me, the key issue is recognizing that the conversation about ethical AI cannot be divorced from the conversation about the role of, of the intellectual property system and the role of IP offices within that system to address the ethical concerns that have been raised, not only about access, but about the purity of the data as well. Well, uh, Professor Kedeji, um, unfortunately, um, we've, we've come to the end of our hour together. Um, I feel we could probably dedicate much more time to unbundle so many of the important issues that uh, you've touched on today. Thank you for uh, sharing your thoughts and expertise and insights. I do have one question before we wrap, wrap up though. Um, we have this conference, we're in our fifth iteration. Uh, we're always looking to the future as what we can do. Um, so based on what you've seen, what should we be building our next conference around? What are we at the cusp of seeing that we should start thinking about now? Um, I think we need to start thinking about, um, particularly with respect to AI, because I don't think that we're going to escape or resolve any of these issues. Um, I, I think we need to start thinking about what appropriate interfaces need to be between artificial intelligence outputs and human innovation and what the IP system should do in response to that. This is going to be a hugely critical problem, applying all the way to subject matter eligibility all the way to rules of acquisition. We're not going to escape that. Um, and we need to start thinking about that now because in a year we will be further along in the structural conditions that AI is already imposing on the way in which we think about pharmaceutical development, the way we think about competition law, the way we think about healthcare. Um, all, of these, all of these sectors are going to be profoundly transformed and the earlier we begin thinking as scholars, as policymakers, as activists, um, as practitioners about how do we deal with human and machine hybrid innovation? What's IP going to do about this? I, I think the sooner we start having these conversations, the better for all of us. Well, Otherwise the machines will tell us what to do. That's a, that's a great, place to, to, to leave it. Uh, again, thank you, Professor Akeji, for thank being Thank you so here. much for having me. Congratulations on an excellent conference. <laughs>